And she said, there is no line. We are all part of one crew, trying to make our day, trying to make something great, and we're all in it together. No job is too big, no job is too small, and, and that's been my philosophy. You know, and no is not an option. And uh, we wanted to honor Tracy Sher with the Raimondo Rezzonico Award because we treasure the visionary producers who enable dreams to come to life, who put their faith in filmmakers when they are unknown, who put their faith in projects when they exist only on paper before they reach the screen. And to do that, you need people like Stacy Scher. So please give her a warm round of applause to Stacy Scher. Thank you. I didn't say anything about what Stacy did because you will get into that in a couple of seconds and the conversation will be moderated by Manlio Gomarasca. <laughs> Have a wonderful conversation, ask a lot of questions. Thank you for being here and most of all, Stacy, thank you so much for giving us this great honor to celebrate your achievements here in Locarno, for accepting the Raimondo Razzonico Award, and for giving us this moment that we will treasure forever. Thank you so much. I am the one who's gonna treasure it forever. I'll never forget what happened last night, and it's great to be with you all right now, and honestly, the encouragement to, to keep pushing forward, and thank you for recognizing producers, because we are often the unsung heroes of and also, like, Roche Beaubois, what's, what's happening here? Like, my favorite designer of furniture. This is so gorgeous, right? Is this we did it for beautiful? you. <laughs> so, Stacey, first of all, how was the feeling yesterday night in the Piazza Grande in front of that huge audience? It's funny because um, I think somebody said to me, oh no, we've got a crier on our hands. <laughs> and I just started, it, it, it was twice. Yesterday when we first met, um, I was walking in to introduce Aaron Brockovich and I hadn't seen the film in a very long time and next year it turns 25. And it came out in 2000. And seeing the name of the credits, you know, again, I, I said last night, I, I, I don't often look back. It's hard to get movies made. It's, it, it's always been hard to get movies made, so you have to look forward with a singular focus. And to see the names of people that I'm still working with, people that changed my life that are no longer with us, like the great Ann V. Coates, who was our editor and who edited Lawrence of Arabia and I first met on Out of Sight. Um, it, it was very emotional. Yeah, I can't believe and that. And wild, like I've never seen anything <laughs> like that in my life. It was crazy. So you are a myth for me. I want to know everything about you. So. Let's start from the really beginning. You were born in New York, but rise in Florida, right? Your family was connected to the movie business, and how yeah. did passion come from? No one in my family was connected to the movie business. So I always like to tell that because, and, and when I was fortunate enough to produce the Academy Awards with Steven Soderbergh and Jesse Collins, um, I, I always joke that they asked Steven to do it because it was the year of COVID, so they wanted the contagion people to do the Oscars that year. And mostly, we, like, we were very focused on keeping people safe, you know? Um, but we spent a lot of time interviewing the nominees to show that there are places in cinema for you there, you know, there's this idea that everybody's related to somebody, and it's always like, Nepo baby this and that. But that's just not true. I was born in New York. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I knew no one in the film business. 
I was born into a family of movies, a family that loved movies, a family that watched movies all the time, that absolutely, you know, raced out to see something new. I, I was mad at my mom for about 30 years because um, I was going to summer camp and the movie Jaws was coming out. Now, it's hard to imagine a time when a movie would stay in the theater for the whole entire summer. And I, and I said to her, promise me, you won't go see Jaws without me. And she said, okay, and she saw it that night. And so I was mad at her for, for you know, I would always tell this story, my mother went to see it, and finally, um, uh, they had a great night at the Hollywood Bowl where an orchestra conducted John Williams' score and Jaws was playing and we finally saw Jaws together so I could let it go and now we have matching Jaws uh, socks and stuff. So, But that was what it was like, you know. Imagine being mad at somebody you love for not waiting to see a movie with you because you wanted to see it so badly together and imagine that you grew up in a time where... That happened, there were five movies like that every weekend. That, and, and cinema was the center of the cultural conversation when I grew up in, you know, in, in the late 1970s. Mid to late 1970s, if I'm being fully honest. And which movie were your favorite in the time? Well, I grew up really, you know, first I loved musicals. I always joke that Singing in the Rain is one of my favorite films, and I always joke that my first movie crush was Gene Kelly. Um, I loved him so much, and, um, and I can, you know, one of the few impressions I can do is Lena Lamont in that movie, so um, um, I won't do it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then, you know, we watched a lot of um, the old Warner Brothers gangsters movies, and my, my dad loved them. He loved Edward G. Robinson, and um, he loved James Cagney. And then we watched things like Sullivan's Travels, and um, and then I and and then and I and Hal Ashby had a huge influence on me. And I say that like I. I I inappropriately at a young age saw certain movies that I probably shouldn't have, either because I snuck into them without my parents' permission, which was um, like the Hal Ashby movie Coming Home that Jane Fonda produced and was very involved in getting made. And it was like a secret peek into the world of adults. And then there was this thing that was, it wasn't the Z Channel, I still have to figure out what it was because it was when we lived in Fort Lauderdale and A Clockwork Orange was on. And seeing that movie changed everything for me. I understood the power of cinema to change your mind, to make you feel things. I knew what a director did. But again, I never thought I could have a career in this business. So I went about my life, I started college. Um, I started college really young because I really wanted to get out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. and. Um, and uh, found my way because of a professor um, to graduate film school at USC. A and he said, you seem to really love movies. Have you ever thought of a career in them? And I, I didn't know. So now for me, I like people to know you don't have to know anybody. You, you don't, you have to love it. You have to, I, I even will say to my own kids, and then I'll stop my TED talk here, um, it, it, if you can be happy doing anything else, then choose that. But if you can't imagine yourself being happy doing anything else, then, you know, you know to, 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 to quote uh, one of my favorite films, buckle your seatbelt, it's going to be a bumpy night, you know? <laughs> and when you finally decide, I want it to be... A producer, I want to work in the movie business. I think one of your first jobs was inside of the Ill Ops Productions. Yes, um, I, when I was in graduate film school, I was working all the way through, you know, to, to pay for stuff and live. And, and my family, I always joke that they followed me to California, um, and I was living at home. And um, 
and working during the day, going to school at night because our program was uh, all our classes were at night. And I during that time period, I met a writer. His name is David Simpkins. When I was in grad school, he worked at a company called New World. And um, to give you an idea of what it was like, New World owned Marvel and they didn't make any Marvel movies because nobody was making any Marvel movies then. They did make things like Children of the Corn and Angel. Um, the, the subtitle of Angel was Hollywood Honor Student by Day, Hollywood Hooker by Night. These are the kinds of movies. But this, this aspiring writer became my friend because I was working also on, on music videos. And he had an idea for a movie and I said I thought it was great. And Meanwhile, I met Deborah and Linda, and I was being hired on a trial basis. And while I was on my trial basis right out of school, David gave me his script. They loved it. I gave it to them. They loved it. We bought it preemptively, and it became the first movie that I worked on, and I got hired permanently, and it was called Adventures in Babysitting. Um, and uh, that was my, my, my first film experience. Can you give us a portrait of Deborah Hill? For me, Deborah Hill is a myth also because uh, she is uh, the woman that gave, that gave the opportunity to John Carpenter to make Halloween. She was one of the first independent uh, women uh, in the sector at the time. So, Deborah Hill was the greatest. She, I learned everything I learned about my approach to being on set and producing and my attitude towards people um, in, in helping comes from her. She would say, you know, that when you look at a film budget, there are certain things they call the above the line costs and the below the line costs. And above the line are the actors and the producers and the directors, and below the line are the creative technicians. Stunts and transportation and everything, hair, makeup, wardrobe, production design, camera. And she said there is no line. We are all part of one crew trying to make our day trying to make something great, and we're all in it together. No job is too big, no job is too small, and, and that's been my philosophy. You know, and no is not an option. You figure out a way to get it done. And so um, I, I miss her every day. Um, she, she passed away when she was 54 years old, and um, she was Absolutely courageous, and I'll tell you another amazing thing about Deborah Hill. I made a film that was um, about the World Trade Center film uh, with Oliver Stone. I was pregnant with my second child, who's now 20, and I was in New York, and it was very close to 9-11. Um, it, was, it was only th three years after, maybe two years after, and I was on the street corner, I was going, I had just come back from, it was the last trip I could take, I was, I, um, I was going to visit the set of our movie Camp. Um, and I saw her on the corner, I can see it as clear as day, and she said, oh great, I was just thinking about you. I've met these two incredible men, we're gonna tell their story together. And I thought she was crazy. It was the story of the last two men who survived the Trade Center who were rescued, these two incredible Port Authority policemen. And I thought, okay, w at that point, we still had a small discretionary fund that we could option their life rights. And I thought, this, I, I wanna do this for Deborah because she means so much to me, she's done so much for me, I wanna do this for her. And that became the gift that she actually gave to me. The movie came out when the week that she passed away. Um, I think she knew that we had put Oliver on the film, um, but she was very, quite ill. And she's the only person I know that the week that she passed away could have two movies open in the top 10. <laughs> the Fog and, and World Trade Center. Uh, she was, extra and, and still has one of the biggest franchises to ever exist in Halloween continuing. And so her legacy in, tra in training people like me, the impact she had on women like Gail Ann Hurd. Um, you know, James Cameron was the um, special effects on, on Escape from New York. She, she was one in a million and as kind as she was talented and passionate. Okay.
Can I ask an applause for Deborah Hill? Thank you. Which was the first set uh, it was on, uh, like executive producer? Well, the very first set I was on, weirdly, um, because I would later become close with him in continuing a fellowship in Deborah Hill's honor, and, and we also lost him to cancer last year. Strangely, the first set I was ever on was the set of Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I was not involved in it, but I had worked on Twisted Sister videos and um, the, ba the band that sings We're Not Gonna Take It, and they're in the end of Pee Wee's Big Adventure when they break onto the Warner Brothers lot, so I was invited to go visit. So that was the first time I was ever on a real movie set. Um, uh, you know, I was on the set of Adventures in Babysitting quite a bit, even though I didn't have a producing credit on it. Um, I was the associate producer of Chris Columbus's second film about Elvis Presley called Heartbreak Hotel, Heartbreak. and I was on set every day of that. Um, I was on set every day of The Fisher King, yeah. which um, I developed the script with Richard Lagravenez um, and, and Linda Obst and Deborah Hill, and got the great opportunity to watch the magical madness that is Terry Gilliam on a daily basis. Tell me about him, please. <laughs> you know, I love Terry Gilliam. I can't stand that he, every other week people are saying that he's controversial and he, he, that's Monty Python. That's how he grew up. He grew up saying things that were outrageous. He started as an animator. He likes to poke the bear. That's who he is. He's a man, he literally, is the man that tilts at windmills. And he was so kind and encouraging of me on that film. He was so innovative. There's a sequence in, in the movie, and, and this is all him, it wasn't in the script, um, and, and Richard would be the first to acknowledge it. There's a scene when Robin Williams' character is um, following uh, Amanda Plummer's character through Grand Central Station. Now, we, we had to, in those days, there were no tax incentives, right? So everything was shot in LA. And we had to beg, and this was a, a great Deborah moment, we had to beg to go to New York for a week. And we had to beg to go to New York. Like the studio was like, well, you can go to New York at the end of the schedule if you stay on budget. But that's madness. Then we would have been matching the light of Los Angeles doubling as New York in New York, so we begged to go at the beginning and Deborah made it happen. And so we were shooting in New York, we had no cover, we, at that time lighting was very different. The lights that had to get brought in and the only time we could get Grand Central Station was in the middle of the night. So we had like portable stadium lights for, for football games brought in and in the windows of Grand Central, Central Station. But we could only afford I think it was a thousand extras, and um, which looked like five people in Grand Central Station. Yeah. And as we scouted, Terry said, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody started to dance and to waltz on the scout? So that became the plan, people would pair up. Um, but we also couldn't afford dancers, and if we called the thousand extras dancers and hired dancers, we couldn't afford the scene anymore. So we had to have like a dance captain. And first we started off playing the Waltz of the Blue Daniel, Danube, and then um, that didn't work out so well. And then at a certain point, somebody just was counting all night long. One, two, three, one, two, three. But when he got in the cutting room, because we were still cutting on film, it looked empty to him. And he looked at it and he said, flip the negative and double it. <laughs> and so if you look, there's like a ghostly doubling of the dancers to create that effect. And he's magic, you know, he's, he's a magical person. Oh, the sequences is incredible, in fact. I didn't know that it was uh, like improvised, it was not on the script, in fact, oh, incredible. <laughs> It, it wasn't. It was planned. It wasn't improvised, but it, it was an a, idea that occurred to him um, in uh, on the scout. And I will say his his typical Gilliam esque sense of humor, um, because it was Amanda Plummer. He put women in um, in nuns' habits 
dancing, you know, so that it looked like the sound of music because her father is Christopher Plummer. So it, it's, there, those are little, the little things that he's put throughout. What did you enjoy uh, being on the set in the time? What did you like on the living on the set? I, I mean, I love being on a set. I love the challenge of making the day. I love, you know, look, if you do your job well, you're kind of hanging out. But if, and, and you have to say, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like camp counselor, you know, mom, um, at, you know, making sure everyone's feelings are good and energy is good and interpersonal dynamics are okay and this one's stressed out and yelling at that one and you got to keep it all calm. Um, and then you just have to remind the filmmaker, you know, you've got it or are you sure, you know, I can get you more time if you need more, you know, when to, to fight for more time. But I, I love all of it, you know. I've been so fortunate to be able to watch cinematographers like Seamus McGarvey or the great Bob Richardson or, you know, um, Chung Hoon, who we just did um, Heretic with, uh, who did all of the Park Chan Wook movies. And I, it's, um, it's, it's a blessing, you know. I, I got to work on Fisher King with the great Mel Bourne. You know, I, I love, I'm a nerd for the jobs that people do. Like, I think, you know, I, I talked about um, our costume designer from, she did Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs, Get Shorty, um, Almost Famous, Jerry Maguire, Betsy Hyman. Um, you know, I love hearing the stories of how she came up with the idea for the coat in Almost Famous, like, I, or how they get the ideas of, how a character moves, because that, you know, the director, the costume designer, and the actor, they build the character together when they first put the clothes on. I, I love listening to John Travolta talk about, like one day he showed us the difference between how Vinny Barbarino, Vincent Vega, and Chili Palmer all walked. And, or, or um, his ca character, from Tony Manero. So, it, and, and, I, every day I say I'm privileged. Every day I'm so lucky to do what I love. So I, I think you can't forget that, you know. Um. <laughs> what happened after the Fisher King? Was there a moment that you have feeling that your career was going in one direction when you have that feeling that something new is going to start? I, I just knew that there were a group of people that felt the same way I felt about movies. You know, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, it's not about cl always climbing the ladder, right? It's about the lattice, you know, and getting to know your generation of peers um, and we had a community. We had a community who went to movies together, who talked about movies. I mean, again, you can do that when you're 22, 20, you know, look, we can still do that now, but, you know, then there's other things. There's your kids and your life and your, you know, and, 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 but when you're young and, obsessed with something and you can see, think about nothing else, we had that community. And um, it, it was 24 seven. You know, it was books and music and movies and, you know, and, and it's a great privilege to seize onto that. And, you know, it was also a monoculture, right? It, the, now there's not that many what in America we call we used to call water cooler moments, which means you'd come back in to school or work and stand around the water cooler and everybody was talking about, did you see, you know, did you see that movie this weekend? Or it doesn't happen as much because everything's like, well, I like alt country with a this thing and I only listen to this or and I think it's why people are so drawn when there's like phenomenon and people that transcend everything, like Beyonce or 
Taylor Swift or, you know, uh, or film or, or Barbie or Oppenheimer, things that transcend, but that used to be the norm. In order to be part of the culture and social currency, you had to share a collective experience. And I think this separation has obviously been exacerbated by and accelerated by the pandemic and social media and all of the things that have cut us up. I mean, and even in like cable TV, if you only want to watch cooking shows all day long, you could do that, right? <laughs> so, um, but it's good to stretch, you know? It's good to see things and hear other points of view and expand your horizons. And I, I mean, one of my favorite movies growing up, again, <laughs> something I probably shouldn't have seen when I was that young. Um, and, and really, my parents are great parents, and I really don't think they knew. Again, that's another thing. Nobody was tracking you all the time. So they didn't know I was you know, seeing Midnight Cowboy, which was rated X, um, but which is crazy that it was rated X. But you think this movie is a story of profound loneliness and the desire to connect and of two unlikely characters that on face value, I had nothing in common with. But I was so profoundly moved by their desire to connect. And again, that's the transformative power of cinema and storytelling and what we have to all keep alive. I mean, and I think we, we have, I would say that it's a, Moonlight is a cousin of that. Um, and it was great that it won the Oscar because more people saw it, you know, and, and shout out to Mubi because I think it's on Mubi. So, and, and I, I met those folks last night and they're doing great work. So, and making it possible for everybody to see films like that. And then in your life and your career come Michael Schamberg and Danny DeVito. Let's talk about the experience in Jersey film. You know, those guys were the greatest um, mentors and co-conspirators and partners that I could have had because they, we shared the same taste. When we didn't share the same taste, we each had a deal that we trusted each other. And we went for it and we all believed in, in filmmakers, you know, and Danny obviously um, was a big director and movie star and Michael had already made The Big Chill and A Fish Called Wanda and, you know, I had just, come to work there off of being associate producer of The Fisher King. Um, I think I was still finishing up when I started. Um, and I think what was expected of us was very different than what maybe the studios got from us. I think they wanted us to behave more like a typical Hollywood company that was going to make what was extremely popular at the time, like romantic comedies and you know, action comedies, and, and I'm not denigrating those. I'm a big fan of those. I, I love them, I consume them, but at that time, my personal fascination were these auteur films, or I guess great stories. Like, I remember, you know, uh, we met Quentin Tarantino very early. Um, I, I've told this story a lot, so <laughs> sorry if you've already read it somewhere, but, um, the Hollywood Reporter and all the trade publications had a, a section that was really for crew members or for extras casting, and it was called Future Films in the U.S., Future Films Outside the U.S. And I would go through it and scour it for a filmmaker or a writer who had a great cast, but I didn't know their name. And then I would get the script. And so that's how I first read Reservoir Dogs. And I was trying and trying and trying to meet Quentin, who was as hard to get a hold of then as he is now. Um, he, you know, he famously doesn't have a cell phone um, and, and never did. Um, and my, one of my closest friends was um, Lawrence Bender's roommate. And you know, we all had odd jobs and things like that. They were working on, he's now, my friend Chris is now a huge TV showrunner who does The Godfather of Harlem and um, all of those shows. But we were all at 
uh, premiere screening that we were all like, we all got tickets to, um, and it was Terminator 2. <laughs> and, um, and I was standing, talking to you again in the, in the, you have a group of friends. Um, I was talking to my friend Callie Corey, who wrote Thelma and Louise, and my friend Chris, who I'd gone to the screening with, and Harvey Cattell started to walk over because, to say hello to, to Callie because they had just shot, but it hadn't come out yet, Thelma and Louise. And then a young man started to walk up, and Chris turned to me and said, I'm about to make your night meet Quentin Tarantino. And we just became instant friends and hit it off. And he hadn't started shooting Reservoir Dogs. We were finally able to have a meeting with him. We offered him a book. He said, I'd prefer to try and write originals unless, and, unless that doesn't work out. And so we made a blind deal for, for him and Lawrence um, to make their second film for Jersey Films, three films that were one film called Pulp Fiction. <laughs> and Pulp Fiction changed everything in history of cinema, because after Pulp Fiction, a lot of movies try pretend to be for a lot of years similar to Pulp Fiction. So you were involved in Pulp Fiction from the really beginning, because we have a, a master class years ago with uh, Roger Avery, and uh, he told us that uh, the script was crazy because it was so big, Quentin was still putting stuff in st story inside, so it was so bigger than the movie that in the end we saw. What do you remember about that creative uh, process? There are a lot of things that I remember about it creatively, but you guys are like recording, so I don't really feel comfortable talking about some of this stuff. And I really appreciate, like, if I if if I'm going to tell this next story, please don't be jerks and tweet it or anything like that. Um, after, um, after, Re after after Reservoir Dogs played at Cannes, Roger Quentin and I drove to Amsterdam from Cannes. And um, at a certain point, I, I was like, I'm gonna do all the driving. I, I cannot let these two people drive. Because like, I just remember like at one point, I was sitting in the back seat, and people were like turning around to talk to me about like, and, and we were going there, because Roger and Quentin were gonna finish writing the script. Quentin had written the beginning, he was reading part of it to us. Um, it was that part that I actually heard the pumpkin and honey bunny for the first time, and and um, and they were ad they were there so that Roger could adapt the middle section from his screenplay um, that that uh, the gold watch came in. And the movie's also very personal to me because my late father, um, Quentin, loved my dad, and he plays Bruce Willis's boxing coach who wakes him up, he was not an actor, and says, it's time, Butch. So for, for me, I, 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 we had the 30th anniversary screening in Los Angeles, and um, it was great to see my dad for a second up there. So, um, But it was, um, you know, it, 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 it went on for, the writing process went on for a while. Like, it started when he was living in Amsterdam, and he'd call us sometimes and read things. And he was writing before, we, he was already in Amsterdam before um, the Reservoir Dogs night um, in Cannes, and then Roger stayed, then Roger left, then Quentin came back, and originally the third act was completely different. Um, it was gonna, it, 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 it was just a completely different version of it. And then um, I remember he was in the office, like, because Lawrence and Quentin had offices at Jersey Films, and he would say to me, I've just written a scene where something unspeakable happens, and, and he, but I'm not gonna tell you yet. And I was like, okay, fine, you know, I know you'll read it to me soon. And so it, it just went like that until finally um, uh, a script came and it said Pulp Fiction, 162 pages, final draft. <laughs> and that's the movie we made and shot and very little is out of it. Just, I think we just cut one scene out of the movie. And how did you make the cast? The cast is incredible in Pulp Fiction. And John Travolta, he renewed his career. It was amazing to see him in that movie. What do you remember about the cast and the shooting of the movie? I, I, one of my biggest memories we talked about a little bit last night, which was, you know, John was not back at the apex of his career when Quentin cast him. 
And but Quentin wanted him, and everyone agreed, and everyone backed him, and they spent time together. And and John recently told stories of, in this weird coincidence, when he went to Quentin's apartment, he realized that he had lived in that same apartment earlier. And they ended up playing board games. I think they played the Welcome Back Cotter game, um, <laughs> because Quentin collects board games of TV shows. And um, we got out of the screening. And the audience at the festival was electric. And all of a sudden, people started screaming, John Travolta, Saturday Night Fever, John Travolta, and shaking the cars. And we knew that it was a moment. But I mean, we didn't know that the film was going to be that. We knew that it was great. But no one, we, we, you don't know that you're going to change culture. It's incredible, in fact. We didn't talk about a movie that you made before that is a Reality Bites, that is a generational cult, in fact, and is a, the, the director debut of Ben Stiller, right? And what happened with Bon of Ox and the soundtrack of the movie? Okay, I'll try and, I'll try and make my answer shorter so that we can get... Um, so uh, Ben Stiller directed Reality Bites. I will also say it was um, the American... Uh, cinematography debut of Emmanuel Lubezki, which is one of the reasons why the movie is so gorgeous. And he was so, Chivo, so great to work with. Um, so Evan Dando from the, from the 90s band Lemonheads is in the movie. Um, he, he, he's at the very end. He's like the parody version of um, Ethan Hawke's character when Ben Stiller's character makes a reality TV show out of them. And, and weirdly, the original title of the movie was The Real World. And then The Real World reality show came out and we had to change it. And, and then since the little documentary that they made out of her documentary was called Reality Bites, um, that's, that became the name. And uh, it's funny when the name of a film that you have becomes in itself like you know, like reality bites for this stock or something, you know, it's weird. It's, we see it all the time now. So we originally wanted as the first end title song to be um, one of the new Lemonhead songs. And the second one was this band, The Posies, um, called Bed of Roses. And, you know, we were, again, in the like, what a producer does. That was not a big budget movie. And even though it was a studio film, it was a low budget studio film. And, um, and it wouldn't have gotten made if Winona Ryder, who at that time was the biggest young star, you know, the Jenna Ortega of her time. I, ironically, now they're together. And, um, and, and my friend Alan Miles' fantastic script for Tim Burton. Um, and uh, so we were like scraping for music. And we got a record deal where we got extra money. I mean, this is so funny because the music industry has changed so much too. We got extra money for every gold artist and every platinum artist that we could put on the soundtrack. So um, the Lemonheads were a gold artist, and we were. And and what happened was they said, um, "I'm sorry, you know, we're not going to let our song be in a movie. Not not the band, the record label." And so all of a sudden, we didn't have an end title. So we said, well, we'll move the posies up. Now, the way I tell the story is a little different. It's, it turns out it's not true. Um, <laughs> because at the 25-year anniversary of the movie, Ethan Hawke and Ben and Lisa Loeb and Winona and, and Janine, we were all on a panel together. And I started to tell the story I'm about to tell you. So we're showing the movie to Ethan in New York for the first time. And we needed to get clearance on a U2 song, um, All I Want Is You, that is in the movie. At that point, in order to take the movie to screen for Bono to get permission, we had to carry the film cans, because it was the last movie that I, I think we cut on film, because um, Avid's came out the next year in 92. And um, we were ready, Ben and I, because we had to hand carry them. When we got a call during the screening saying, Bono can't make the screening anymore, but he's given you permission, and now we had a night free. 
In my version of the story, we then went to go see Ethan's friend's band, um, Lisa Loeb and Nine Stories, because she was part of his theater company and they knew each other really well. Apparently that never happened, which he pointed out to me. We did see her in concert, but it was after the movie came out and the song was a hit. We met her, Ethan had sent us a tape, and we did hang out with her, but what we said was, well, let's move the posies into first end title and we'll put Ethan's friend Lisa into second end title. And until Macklemore, she was the first unsigned artist to go to number one on the billboard charts for like 30 years, something like, or 20, 25 years. And she then got signed and obviously has had a great career since then and Ethan directed the music video and it was all in one take with her and her cat in her apartment and um, yeah. So memory's a funny thing. Another amazing movie that she produced is Gattaca. Can you tell me something about it? Okay. I'll tell you one really funny story and I'm gonna try and, I'm, I'm gonna try and make it like shorter, sorry. I'm really, probably had too much coffee because I'm really jet lagged, so chattier than usual and, and still from last night. So um, two funny stories about Gattaca. Again, not made for a lot of money, got made because we had um, Ethan and Uma, um, Andrew Nichol, who had written The Truman Show, had wanted to direct The Truman Show. Our company was able to make sure that he could direct Gattaca, which was the script that he wrote next. So we couldn't afford to have a tank for this. There's a sequence when, um, has anybody here seen the movie? Okay. So they, they swim off and the, the two brothers, one who is genetically superior and Ethan's character who's been faking it the whole entire time. And, um, and the close-up dialogue, you know, how did you beat me? I never saved anything for the way back or was supposed to happen in a tank, but, but it's really expensive to film in a tank. So someone told us that if we shot in an Olympic-sized pool that had a glass roof so that you could light through it so that it looked like the moon, and you put a forklift inside the Olympic-sized swimming pool, when the forklift went up and down, it would work exactly like a wave maker because we couldn't afford any of that. We get there, it does not work <laughs> at all. And so the line producer and I are lying on the ground at the pool with kickboards making waves. And to me, that's what a producer does. There's no job too big or too small. If you need waves and you can't afford them, you're on your stomach on the ground making waves, you know? So the other one was when they go and walk into the beach, I didn't tell you this one. So we didn't know that um, they strip off their clothes and they're naked and, and um, they're about to walk into the water. And this is really at the beach. And all of a sudden the cops come up and they're like, uh, There's, this is a non-nudist beach. You, you can't do that. We're gonna pull your shooting permit. And so then we had to think really quickly and now a phenomenal costume designer, but at that time she was an onset wardrobe um, person, Cindy Evans, we came up with an idea and we took, the grips gave us monofilament, the in, invisible, you know, like plastic and they made G-strings for the boys out of monofilament so that we could keep shooting. <laughs> so these are the secrets of making movies. And I hope you keep them secret even though you're all <laughs> filming this, so there you go. This is only fun when I can actually be honest with you guys, you know? That's the drag a little bit of social media, you know, because you can't have an intimate gathering where you can kind of give people the real. Did you see how many people were for the screening yesterday of Erin Brockovich? How is it possible that this movie is still so modern nowadays? How does the story come to you and how this movie is still an important movie for people? Well, I mean, thank goodness because the real Erin Brockovich is still doing great work and I'm glad that the movie is resonant and gives her a platform because she's still fighting for people to have clean water to drink and for us to get microplastics out of um, you know, the average person eats a credit card size worth of microplastics a week in their in what they have. Um, she says as she holds a plastic bottle. Um, 
Anyway, um, uh, but it, it, the real um, Michael Shamberg's wife, Carla, um, met Aaron through her chiropractor. She said, I've met this woman, I'm treating her. Her story would be an incre incredible life story and make a great movie. And um, she wasn't cynical. And she met her. And she said, this woman is rocky in a miniskirt, and Julia Roberts should play her. And some people questioned that. I was not one of the people. And um, we were very fortunate that we were able to um, pay for the script. Um, at that time, Susanna Grant was a young writer who was introduced to us by Gail Lyon. And then Richard Legravenes took over and did the rewrite. And w Julia came on board. And, um, and we were finishing up Out of Sight with Steven Soderbergh. And he read it overnight and committed. And then Julia said, yes, with Steven, I will do the movie. And, 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 and then we got Albert, and the rest is history. What, what kind of director and person is Steven Soderbergh? Because you bring him. Uh, to direct a movie very different from the movie of his starting career. I mean, I don't know, Out of Sight is his first East movie. And Erin Brockwich is still a, a totally different movie. And then you also produce a movie that is very, was very prophetic in a way called Contagion. He, Steven's just the smartest, the hardest, the hardest working. He, he's always looking at like, the math to figure something out, you know. Um, he always likes to change. He doesn't like to repeat himself. Um, I think he has certain, he really understands the impact of a visual language on an audience. So in Out of Sight, there were different color palettes and he really perfected this in traffic. But, um, you know, we had, um, Ectochrome in the flashbacks um, in Out of Sight, you know, when you were on the prison yard with, um, with the Ripper and, and in traffic so that you knew which story you were in, he used different color palettes. But he didn't want to repeat himself in Contagion and just do that and cheat. So he would make up different, uh, different cinema grammar so that you could imperceptibly influence the audience and, um, let them know where they were in the story. I think another movie that we should talk about is Man on the Moon, Man's Form. It's true that Jim Carrey was inside of the character during the shooting and also outside the shooting for all the time of the production. When you were on set with him, he was either Tony or Andy. You could only address him as Tony or Andy, whoever he was playing on the day. I loved it. Um, I think the first day of shooting, he drove up in an, uh, Andy drove up in an ice cream truck and crashed the ice cream truck into the soundstage um, and gave everyone ice cream. And uh, Tony Clifton had like Limburger cheese inside his pockets and would shake people's hands and they would stink like cheese um, for the whole day. And he thought it was really funny if senators came to visit the set and were being shown around and they would have stinky cheese hands afterwards. Um, and it was magical, you know. Obviously, the documentary was made, um, and <laughs> it's so funny to look back at at your younger self. You know, I'm not used to. For me, looking back was looking at that clip reel or looking at the opening of Aaron Brockovich, and it just takes you right back to who you were and what what was going on then. But to actually see yourself on set and you know you're playing a role, I, like, and I, Danny, there's a scene where Danny's in hair and makeup, and I'm like, oh, Tony was so late for Milos today. What's he? Get, what are we gonna do? And you know, it's just totally phony because I was, I thought it was hilarious the whole entire time. I was all in. Uh, the movie is, is amazing. I mean, that, 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 that was another movie that changed uh, things. Then you start uh, another company called Double Feature Films. Why the name Double Feature? That reminded me the double bill, the double feature that you usually... Um, I have to say, um, my former partner, Michael Schamberg, was always very good at naming companies. He named Jersey Films because Danny was from Jersey, but we weren't. <laughs> and he thought it was funny. Actually, my husband, Carrie, came up with Double Feature because there were three of us and then there were two of us. And, and so it was... Double, it was a, a, a kind of play. And then 
my company now that's just me is called Shiny Penny because that's what um, my dad used to call my daughter. Um, so that's that's sort of the origin of the names. But yes, we, um, uh, you know, things just evolved, you know. Um, and we did a bunch of great films together at both of those companies. And then I took a little break before Shiny Penny, which where when my kids were at a certain age and I went to go work um, as an executive uh, at a large gaming company, um, l thinking about film and television, we made an animated show and, and then um, a television show that I had pitched um, to Danny and Michael and my former partner in, in um, television, John Landgraf, who now is the great John Landgraf of FX, the most nominated Emmys of any television company in history this year with The Bear and Shogun. Um, I pitched a television show called Mrs. America, and when it came together with Kate Blanchett, um, I thought, okay, it's time to go back to producing and start it on my own for the first time in my whole career. And what about coming back to work with Quentin Tarantino in Django and Shade? Did you were a fan of uh, the Italian Spaghetti Western? Did you know Django by Sergio Corbucci? Masterpiece, of course. I love all the Sergios, okay? <laughs> I love Sergio Leone. I love Sergio Corbucci. Um, Sergio Salima. And, and I know his son Stefan, Stefano, who I'm a big fan of. And actually, when I was at Activision, we were developing uh, a movie together. Um, Yes, I, I mean, you know, who didn't grow up watching The Good, The Bad, and the, the, the Dollars trilogy, right? It's the greatest. I love Italian cinema. I, I mean, look, I, I also, I love Italian cinema. I, it's just like boring to say, I, I, you know, I, Rocco and his brothers, and, you know, every Fellini film, and many of them I didn't get to see until I was older because of growing up in a place like Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where there was no access to see foreign films. So I didn't get to see the French New Wave films and I didn't get to see you know, Italian neorealism and things like Open City until I was older. So I could truly appreciate it. And, and you know, Knights of Kiberia and Amacord, like two of my favorite films as, as well. And, Anyway, um, but I, I did, however, see the Dollars Trilogy growing up because, you know, you'd see them on TV. And um, it, it was so much fun and so hard. And the cast was amazing and crazy things happened. Like we got, it was a year where there was no snow. There was no snow in, in um, the mountains in, in, in the Sierra Nevadas of California. We were supposed to shoot in Mammoth Mountain. Everything was planned. We started out in Lone Pine and to shoot the opening walk up with the tooth wagon and, and Schultz meeting Django and, and we were and the campfire scene around the Alabama Hills and you know, places where old westerns that, that Quentin also loved were shot. And then the snow just didn't come. And we had to very quickly figure out that we were gonna go to Wyoming, pick up the whole crew, plan very quickly, move to Wyoming, but magical things happened. That sh there's a shot, and, and you know we're screening the film later today, where um, we got them into the Buffalo Preserve, just the two of them, and, and the beautiful Jim Croce song, I've Got a Name, is playing as, you know, they're going through their time of being bounty hunters. And, and we found that crazy hot springs that we put Jamie into and he had a vision of Carrie. And, um, you know, it, it was it, it, just magical things like that happened. And what I really love the movie, because when Quentin Tarantino makes a movie like that, it's not only an homage, it's something more, because it's a kind of, it's a Western, of course, it's a spaghetti Western, but it's also a pop movie with a taste of black exploitation. So he likes to mix all the things that he loves to make something new, something modern. Well, yeah, it, his genius is more than that. Yes, he can mix all different kinds of genres to make something completely new, and he can do it and entertain you while tackling an issue that people didn't want to look at. So you had to look at a very ugly time in American history 
but he kind of sucker punches you. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. We're going to laugh. Okay, but now you're going to look at it. And in the end, you're going to have a black superhero who literally and metaphorically blows up the institution of slavery at the end of the movie and rescues the love of his life. So it's a, he always said, you know, it's a Western, but it's also the story of rescuing a princess. Yes, true. We are running out of time, so I'll let you make some question. Please raise your hands. There, first, and then you. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Mendy Bala. I'm a student from the University of Edinburgh. I'm a film student. And uh, before I start, I must say, like, your whole filmography is incredible. Um, I did want to ask, uh, as a young student trying to get into the industry, uh, I understand there's not as much representation for women. And I want to know, what would you suggest is the best way for someone like me to break into the industry? I hate to answer it in kind of like a Nike way, but just do it. Um, <laughs> You know, because there's more now than there were when I did it. And you just find your, find your peers. And, you know, I, I, I feel like things are really... Are you from Scotland? I'm from London. Um, well, look, there's a great British film industry with great mentorship. And, yes, there is not... There's not a lot of female representation, but there's a lot more than there was. And people are at least conscious of it. And... You know, I made a joke last night that I used to have to start everything with, like, this might be a really bad idea, yeah. but have you ever considered thinking, or, you know, but go for it. You know, when you have something to say and you have a burning passion, know those things, that's undeniable. You know, and, and look, yes, there's agencies to break in at. There's, there are, there are production companies that the... Production companies in London are very healthy because of uh, subsidies and the requirement that a certain amount of content has to come from the UK. So just, you know, while you're at Edinburgh, learn everything about the new writers that are coming out of Fringe. You know, that's a great opportunity. The new comedians, look, what, what was the, num the number one show started as a play that was at Fringe? Before that, the number the, the other play that started at Fringe was number one, and before that, it was Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Just you can be a specialist in things that people who are established can't know, because you're at ground zero of culture. Right, so you. good luck. Thank you so much. <laughs> Qui davanti c'è una domanda, scusa. Oh, thank you. So, uh, thanks to be with us first, because it's very interesting to hear your past, your, when you started, and you can give a lot of uh, um, good suggestions for uh, all the younger in, in this uh, field. And um, years ago, at the A5 Film Festival in LA, uh, they ask uh, to uh, during the round table some filmmakers, uh, this director, where do you think the movie that will go in the future? And he said, television. So he opened a kind of idea now, this was going on. So I'm asking you, all the production are going now and all the festivals are growing like a mushrooms. What do you think really those movies, they will find a distribution more. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, every time, look, when I started in the late 80s, people said to me, you missed it. It's over. Yeah. The best of the film Always. industry is behind <laughs> you, right? Yeah. So I think people keep saying, cinema's dead, you know, uh, the pandemic finally killed cinema, and you know we're going to catch up this year. Oh, it was only Barbenheimer. No, now we have another big hit movie. 
It, many big hit movies this summer. Then it's like, oh, it's only because it's a toy. Or it used to be, oh, it's only because it's superheroes. Then it's like, nobody wants superheroes. You know, people want to connect original stories that, that want to reach a big audience. At a certain point, all of our great and talented filmmakers with something new to say that we're young, and this is really to young people, figure out how to tell a bigger story that is personal. You know, I mean, it, want to reach a larger audience. When you grew up watching movies in the 70s, you could do everything. You could be Sidney Pollack and get nominated for an Oscar, make a big hit movie that was popular and connect with an audience. Now that's not for every artist. Every artist has a different thing. But I grew up believing that popular film and popular culture could also be artistic. And that's what I meant by the thing about Quentin. It's, yes, he does all these things, but he had something to say about the ugliness of it. And the ugliness of, of, of um, the American sin. You know, and look, when we made The Hateful Eight, we kept hearing, oh, Obama's about to get elected for a second term. We live in a post-racial America. Well, that certainly wasn't true. No. So you can do these things and reach a lot of people. And, you know, Aaron Brockovich is a very entertaining film, but it said, you know, we better watch out because our water's getting poisoned. But the cost of the movie is also now because the voice of the independent, uh, you know, movie. You know uh, that movie must be. <laughs> look, we were able to make that movie for under fifty million dollars, and yeah. and twenty million of it, and I say this proudly, was going to Julia because she was the biggest movie star in the world, and that's what her male counterparts were getting paid, and so we wanted to pay her the same as a movie star of her stature, stature that was a man. So you figure out a way, you know, again, who thought, and I, I thought it was a very similar moment to when we made Pulp, when everything, everywhere, all at once crossed over. And that's exciting. It's exciting that there are new companies, you know, I I'm, feel so blessed right now to be working with A24 because their excitement and their hope and their energy is it means something to the people who go to see their movies, the way that other brands meant something to, you know, people of my generation. Yeah, thank you. So, Anyone sorry, else? I'm hopeful, I'm a Pollyanna, I always hope that the best is coming. Hi, um, my name is Kopiso, I come from Botswana. So that's Southern Africa. And here's my question. This is a statement you've been saying, I think since yesterday, to say um, there was a time that you had to kind of put your words in a certain way so that the people that you're working for could like, you know, um, claim the ideas as theirs and you, you could kind of get you know, progress in a certain direction. And um, I was speaking to someone yesterday to say, unfortunately, that is still my reality. I Sometimes it's mine too, okay? I was being a little bit overly optimistic. <laughs> yeah, um, that's reassuring. <laughs> um, but what I, what I wanted to ask was, how did you um, manage and, and survive in a time where, like, constantly trying to convince people of something that you can see but they can't gets exhausting? Um, we were just speaking now that passion sometimes it's it's like it on certain days it's up and you're really about it and then on certain days it's like you know what I just want to stop I just want to stop and like do something that is more straightforward that won't get um, my feelings hurt as much etc where I'm not trying to fight people all the time I feel like I'm fighting people all the time so what I wanted to ask long story short is, um, how did you cope th through those times 
where it felt like you didn't see yourself in a space like this, where it was still um, putting your head down and trying to make sure that this movie make, sees the light of day, that um, this production is successfully completed in a space where it's like you constantly have to navigate how to tell people in a politically correct or, you know, appealing way that no, maybe we should go this way and kind of just hope that they listen, if you get what I mean. I totally understand. And look, as you get older, it gets a little bit easier as a woman, because we all need to be, we have an overwhelming need to be liked. And, um, you know, one of, one of my female producer friends who's a little bit older than me said, oh, I never gave a fuck about anybody liking me and I didn't care that they thought I was a bitch, okay? Sadly for me, that was not the case. So um, I, and that's why the workarounds, right? That's why the, I don't want to offend anybody and don't come off as too strong and don't, you start to care a little bit less about that. Um, and when you get older, you know, um, I, I will say that you always feel really vulnerable. Um, I, I will say that there are times in my career when I got threatened by people like with, you'll never work again, shut the fuck up, you talk too much, excuse my language, everyone, when I would be fighting, um, where my male counterparts would laugh it off and I felt like my career could be destroyed. And that's a very real feeling. So know that I get exactly what you're saying. Um, I don't, I, and, and building community is really the only way. And it, it's funny now, I, I'm part of a, a group of, we call ourselves career producers. And that means that we don't have a different job. We're not manager producers. We're not actor producers. We're not director producers. We're not, you know, financier producers. This is our only job. And we realize that we used to have community when there were when there were opportunities for there to be deals with producers on studio lots and things like that. And we made an effort to make sure that we're fighting so that younger people can get health care because producers are the only group of people that are not guaranteed health care on sets in the US um, that work without commencement wages forever because there was an old um, lawsuit that producers were managers. So they were management, so they shouldn't be entitled to unionize or have anything. I mean, look, the amazing thing about Hollywood, for all of the things that people talk about elite Hollywood, Hollywood's a union town, you know? Everybody but on that set is protected by a union, has a pension, has health care, has collective bargaining, I mean, except producers. And, you know, they have set wages and they have retirement plans. Now, I know when I talk about all these concepts in Europe, it's, it's very different because the, it's barbaric to think that people don't have universal health care in the United States or paid family leave or any of the things that people in other countries take for granted. But what I can say to you is community because I still feel that way. I will go through a process where there is something that I think is the best thing that I've ever developed with a group of filmmakers that are undeniable that people would die to have. And everyone still says no because nobody wants X this week or nobody wants Y this week or one year everybody wants a limited series and next year nobody wants a limited series. And Everyone wanted an R-rated comedy as a movie, and now no one thinks an R-rated comedy can work. So you just got to keep going, and you need friends. And you need friends for the down days that you and, you... and you need more than one project that you're developing because my, um, my, my former partner, Michael Schamberg, used to say that it's like a balloon. Um, one day one is rising, and the next day the other one loses helium. But... You have to be hopeful. It is a, prof this job that I've chosen is a job of psychotic optimism. <laughs> <laughs>
And, um, you know, and it's, it's why I say if you can imagine being happy or doing something else, then do it. And, and look, there are tremendous opportunities to do other things now. But, I, again, the great gift of last night is I don't have the luxury of looking back very often because of exactly what you're talking about. You're constantly saying, you know, now, now it may not be on a whiteboard or a piece of paper and Katie who works with me laughs at how much I can't stand a Google sheet and, and uh, you know, now it's on a Trello board and every day I have to look at what do I need to do to move this project forward? It's not easy for me. So I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse but um, it's just not easy. And it doesn't matter what you did before. It's what, it, it, it just is like, what can you do for me right now? And you hope that your reputation and your desire to protect people and believe in them no matter what. You know, I think the, the best thing for longevity is to treat people well and um, you know hope to get to work with the same people know your peers be well be be good to the people that are at that are at your that I would call like your your graduating class you know the people you come up with um, for me the great gift is to know the talented people that are younger than me because what I can't do anymore is spot the next Quentin Tarantino out of the trades because I'm not, I'm not looking there now. And, and where that person would be is not where they would be when I was. I can recognize it if somebody says, you've got to pay attention to this. But just keep going. There's bad days, there's good days, just have faith. I want to thank you. Thank you, our Sonic Award, for being with us and for this amazing conversation. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you guys so much. And thank, thank you, all of you.